here and uh, you don't have any money and you know there's a market for it, um, that's uh, it's not a good incentive to go out and do it, but it's certainly one reason that people do go out and do it. And, uh, but when your kids come home and they say, Dad, you're not supposed to do that, <laughs> it does have an effect. And um, it's something we noticed in Alberta too a long time ago. The um, legislation in Alberta went through in 1973, and for a long time people continued to collect fossils illegally. Um, but uh, by educating the people, once the idea got through, in fact, the, the greatest people for protecting the resource are the people. And uh, because you, you don't have enough paleontologists out there, you don't have enough police um, people out there looking for these kind of activities and so on. But if uh, most of the people believe it's wrong and uh, are willing to protect the resources, then they get protected. So uh, the museum in Ulaanbaatar, I mean, the same principle. It's, it's trying to educate the people that uh, the resources in Mongolia are actually really important resources on a world scale. Yeah. Um, if you had found some of the folks fossils and you collected them that they were missing the lake and, and the feet or whatever, and then you found your pin on part that had the part. Where did they get there? Or did they tell you where they got their part? Well, they sometimes know, but most of the time they actually don't know because the um, it goes from dealer to dealer to dealer to dealer. And so there are the in Mongolia dealers. Um, then the material is either smuggled out into China, where it's illegal to import fossils and illegal to export fossils, but it happens. Uh, or Korea or Japan, mostly. And then from there it uh, finds its way to one European country and then through to other European countries. So uh, the, um, the route that these fossils take is really quite devious. We think a lot of them, in fact, are piled into the back of coal trucks and taken across the border into China that way. And then for some reason they get out of China without being caught either. Um, there's a book that just came out, um, which is certainly worth reading if you're interested in this kind of thing. It's by Paige Williamson, and it's called uh, The Dinosaur Artist. And it's about that uh, Tarbosaurus that was sold in, in New York. And it's a fun book, and uh, it's a crazy sort of book. <laughs> Given the history of the site, as you showed us earlier, do you ever run into any post eggs? <laughs> <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. Um, with this, the Tarbosaur um, sample, do you have any evidence of uh, sexual dimorphism, whether it's size dimorphism or any other kind? Not as, not as much as uh, it's supposed to exist in Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, you know, we see variability for sure, um, but I would say that we it has not been just dimorphic so far. What kind of spread do you, I mean, you know, you have a hundred specimens, I'm sure these are not, you know, many of them mm -hmm. not, I mean, very complete or whatever, but probably not to get what kind of a uh, Range, you, yeah, size-wise, do you get uh, we're going do you have a multi-model um, or bi-model or what? You know? Yeah, well, that's that's actually an interesting one. I haven't, I haven't tried that one yet because that's something we've done in Alberta. We've shown that some of the sites are definitely attrition, attritional death of the sample is uh, versus catastrophic, as in the case of say the Alberta sort of bone bed, and. Um, I'd say that uh, most of the animals that we find are mid-range in size. They're in the seven to eight meter range. Uh, with very few of the really big ones, and uh, very, very few of the really small ones. With the large amount of, with a large amount of herbivores you have found, how does this help during setting trends for the progeny? How's it helped uh, interpret? Yeah. Transfer ontogeny. Um, well, we probably knew more about Tarbosaurus ontogeny than uh, Tyrannosaurus rex until recently. Um, but uh, uh, we probably have a, a much more complete record of it uh, now with that many specimens. And so, again, even though they're not complete specimens, which we, these are all partial skeletons for sure. And um, um, 
I guess we have to do a lot more methodology uh, material. So can you give us some examples of some of the ideas that you guys have to explain you know, what is obviously an arbitrary um, um, percentage of uh, Parvosaurus or large predators. I'm looking, I'm sitting here next to <laughs> someone who works for a, a predator a truck, and I'm thinking, you know, is there a way that, uh, that uh, is there any evidence that could explain, for example, as, as in, the, in the case in the, the carpet, you know, a, a distribution of that nature, or what other ideas do you guys have? Uh, I wouldn't say any of the ideas are um, particularly strong, unfortunately. Uh, one thing we've noticed is a lot of the tarbosaurs are, in fact, uh, concentrated at certain levels. These are the skeletons. So, for example, at uh, Boogie Fab, there were the nine skeletons that I mentioned. Well, we've probably doubled that now in terms of uh, animals within uh, an area of about one square kilometer. And um, they are really are all at one level. And uh, the, uh, the beds uh, are clearly um, some kind of flooding event, uh, probably, I would guess, seasonal floods. Um, but it still doesn't explain why there's no other animals. Right. I mean, there, there are a couple of uh, Sauralophus in the same bed, but like we're talking two or three compared to almost 20 Tarbosaurs right now. Um, and uh, so there does seem to be an association, though, with these uh, sheet wash deposits and uh, Tarbosaurus skeletons. Another idea is that uh, well, maybe the Tarbosaurus is just so effective at cleaning everything else up. Um, but it doesn't explain the sauropods, because the sauropods are so big, there's no way that the Tarbosaurus is going to eat, say, sauropod limb bones. Um, so that doesn't make any sense either. And um, so we've gone through a whole run of things, um, you know, uh, Tarbosaurus being the only ones around at certain times of the year, Tarbosaurus passing through the region uh, at a time when um, uh, rains are high and so they have a better chance of being preserved. Um, and so disproportionately high numbers at certain times of the year when the preservation is better. Um, but again, how do you prove it? And um, so I would say I'm still mystified mm -hmm. by the whole thing. Yeah. Quick question. So to the Albertus or bone bed, I know you had a, a age range for the Albertus or sound, and that, that doesn't exist here, but I mean, can you deduce any pack mentality, like a pack? Uh, were the Tarbosaurus pack hunters? Yeah, we kind of wondered that, especially at this one site of Boot and Sad. And uh, there are, um, there was two, two specimens in one quarry where actually they were touching each other. Um, and uh, we have another site as well with a couple of Tarbosaurus in a tree, I guess. And um, so the indication is that this concentration of Boot and Sad, plus you have multiple animals uh, in the same quarries even, so they were obviously buried at exactly the same time. Um, but, uh, um, so it may indicate that. Um, you know, we have some indications as well of other tyrannosaurs as well that they may have been pack hunting animals. But um, it's a hard one to prove. You know, even when you have something like the Albertosaurus bone bed, we have more than 20 individuals in one quarry, um, it's still a hard thing to prove. You can be suspicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, are you finding things like, what about the, the non-dinosaurian fauna? Are you finding things like crocs and turtles and uh, fish and lizards? And does that, is that all, at all similar to what you see in Alberta? Yeah, there's a lot of similarities in, in most of it. There are different taxa. Um, you know, Tarbosaurus is very close to Tyrannosaurus or Displetosaurus in Alberta. Uh, but the, um, uh, the crocs are different, the lizards are different, the mammals are different, um, and some of the small carnivorous dinosaurs are closely related to the ones we're finding in, in Alberta, but they do seem to be different as well. Um, the uh, big problem with the Meg formation is that uh, there is a tendency for the big animals to be the ones that are well preserved. We do find small ones as well, but in most cases we only find partial skeletons. The uh, Jadarka formation, the Barakoya formation, they're, they're better for preserving small things. 
The nice thing about the Meg, though, is that, um, in fact, it's a uh, formation that uh, we used to think the Baron Goya was below it and the Meg was on top. Now we rely on the rear of your finger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are things that we can at least show were, were contemporary animals, even though we find the big ones in the Megs and the mm -hmm. small ones in the Baron Goya. So uh, along those lines, Bill, um, the, I remember the holotype of um, um, Monoritos was found in uh, Bogey and Sap, right? Have you found any better specimens? No, we got one, one two years ago. And, uh, and, uh, but it was no skull, and um, uh, we haven't actually prepared it yet. Huh. Yeah. The geochemical analysis, is it specific enough to differentiate specimens in the same quarter, or is it just for a for a for Right now it's locality to locality, yeah. and certain levels in locality, and we can see the differences, but um, uh, we haven't uh, done enough testing at this point to um, see the pattern better than that, but I'm kind of hoping that eventually we'll get to the stage where maybe we can do quarry by quarry. Mm -hmm. I doubt that we'll ever do that, though. <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> um, you mentioned a lot about paleo environments. Do we have any idea of what sort of environment these animals are going to be living in um, at the time? Well, or is it like a variety of different environments? I know you said there's two different depositional. Yeah, it, it is a variety of environments, but it's, it, what it probably is is, um, uh, what's the name of the big delta in Zimbabwe? Uh, yeah, Akabango? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's something like that. So you're, you're in an area that's uh, relatively arid, uh, except you have an area where there's a lot of water and a lot of vegetation. And uh, these uh, um, bigger dinosaurs are basically living in that environment, and the smaller ones, um, uh, they're living in the more stressed environments, the drier ones at the edge. Yeah. Any evidence of as much volcanic activity is mostly wind? Uh, sandstorms and floods that killed a lot of the animals rather than volcanoes. Yeah, no volcanoes, unfortunately, because uh, um, you know volcanoes are great because they produce ash and lava, right. and uh, that allows you to date things much better. And one of the big problems in Mongolia has always been dating your beds. Yeah. What is Mighty impressive. Nine number raptors in one place isn't bad either. What's the depositional environment like on that side? <laughs> Uh, that's a dry site, which is interesting. <coughs> it's uh, semi arid. And uh, I'm not sure what goes on. I mean, the, the animals are all in light position as well. So they're, they're squatting, um, basically stretched out with their, their heads and so on. But their feet and hands are tucked underneath them, and um, they were buried that way. And uh, I would kind of guess maybe sandstorm, but same stuff as we could tell us. Mm -hmm. Is that the out there that was in time with that other, but in that death post, is that also in the uh, museum in Mongolia? Yeah, it's in uh, Ulaanbaatar. It's uh, come out a couple of times uh, and been displayed in Japan and in New York once. But as a rule, they like to keep it in Mongolia to try and attract tourists as opposed to showing it to other things. But, um, but is it on display now? No, it's not on display now. It's uh, because of the uh, big museum being closed down. At the moment, it's sitting in the basement uh, with, the, with the collections. So we find a lot of trackways of Sauropus, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any indication that they are a herding animal, and if they are herding large groups or small, or is it kind of individual? Yeah, the uh, well, the dragon's tomb probably indicates that they are herding animals, because uh, of all the skeletons that were found there together. Thing. You know, they die all at the same time, the same preservation altogether. The problem with the footprints is that they're so dense mm -hmm. that, in fact, it's really hard to pick out patterns. And uh, the reason footprints weren't noticed for a long time is because uh, um, where they show is mostly on cliffs, and so you'll see the footprint coming out one at a time. A meter over, you'll get another one. A meter over, you'll get another one, you and can, so on. You can use that as an example, even though the footprints are not showing very well there. Yeah, basically, uh, uh, this is the wrong bed, but the idea would be that you get the footprints underneath these ledges. <coughs> and um, so you can look along a ledge like that, and uh, as I said, I mean, one, one site goes for more than a kilometer. Mm -hmm. And uh, one footprint on average every meter. And uh, the footprints do fall.
fallout, and because these are um, coarse grain sandstones in basically a mudstone, uh, when the footprints fall out, they hold together for a while, and so you can find them down on the floor. But it's hard to figure out the association of one footprint with another footprint, and um, that's one thing we haven't done yet. Is, is, is got somebody involved in, who actually works on footprints because um, it's so overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> but last year we did see a site where there was a, a flat area with a, a track. Yes. Right. That's right. And in fact, that's the first ankylosaur track we saw, too. So, the, I mean, for the gallery interpreters here, you know, that kind of uh, preservation, if you go to the dino hall, you're going to see a number of footprints essentially the same. It's a, like a, a natural, you know, um, cast of, of that hands like that. And so, you see examples there. Yeah, I should say that uh, these footprints are so beautifully preserved. Many of them actually have skin impressions on the bottom. And so when you see them, there's nothing more obvious than these things in footprints. So it's so, so weird. <laughs> so many years that uh, nobody ever noticed them. The Poles noticed them and they called them load casts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you plan to build a museum on site over there uh, similar to the Royal Trail Museum? Are those plans still in, uh, ongoing? or uh, Very much dependent on money. And um, unfortunately, they've never really put enough money together to do it. So uh, they've, they've done some uh, museums that are on site. Museum, well, one that's in progress right now. Uh, and I don't know if they actually have enough money to, to, to do it yet. And that's for the planning clerks. Yeah. And the Velociraptor and Protoceratops battle. Are those eggs Velociraptor eggs or Protoceratops? I've heard now they think they're Velociraptor eggs. Oh, uh, the eggs that are found in... Um, yeah, they think it might have been actually... Yeah, the majority of the eggs that were found by the American Museum in the, the 1920s, um, which were identified as protoceratops eggs, and that was because protoceratops was the most common dinosaur they found, and the eggs that they found most commonly, they thought belonged to protoceratops. Right. Turns out that the eggs are, in fact, from oviraptors. Oh, that's and um, I'm not sure we even have good prototype eggs even at this point. Yeah, that's not. So you're saying most of the species that you're finding here have a cousin or close relative in, in North America. And across the assemblage, can you kind of look at the relationships of them to get a sense of whether there's, you know, directional dispersal one way, or is it both ways, or is there any asymmetry? trending more, more one way than the it other? It seems to be both ways, actually. I mean, there's, there's been a lot made of the fact that uh, most of these things uh, seem to originate in Asia and end up in North America. But then, um, you know, stuff that's being found now in the Cedar Mountain Formation, uh, it ends up being more primitive versions of the ones that are in Asia. <laughs> and uh, consequently, I think there's, there's still a lot more we have to know um, about uh, the different dinosaurs at different levels and different depositional environments and everything else. And of course, we have big ceratopsis now in Asia as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think we're going to have to find a Danakyrus in Alberta. I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's, it's very strange in, in the sense that um, okay, we've got three skeletons of Danakyrus now, but considering the hundreds and hundreds of skeletons that have been collected in Mongolia in the Namek Formation, three is not very many. And uh, so, for a big animal that appears, if it was eating fish, because it's got uh, fish vertebrae in its stomach, it's in the ideal depositional environment for being preserved as a big animal, and we don't see that. Um, so, do they get into North America? I don't know. I kind of hope they do. <laughs> Always something else for us to look for in Alberta down here. Let's thank Dr. Curry again. And thank you all again for coming out for this special kind of last minute seminar. Um, but we do have to wrap up too because I know there's another event that's coming in to use the Times Mirror Room. Thank you. That's why it's talking faster and faster. <laughs>